please. Okay. So welcome to today's Contemporary Issues Forum. My name is Kim Weichel. I am co-chair of CIF along with my husband, Carl. We host two programs a month on Zoom. Our next program will be on Sunday, May 1st, where I'll be having a conversation with the RRUUC intern minister, Kirsten Lodal. She'll be speaking about her wide background and different interests from trends in progressive theology, poverty alleviation, and answering the call. Uh, today's program is co-sponsored by Cedar Lane Church and the UN Association of the National Capital Area, where Don Bliss and I have been active for many years. So um, I have known Don for a number of years, again, through our work um, with the UN Association. Um, Don and I uh, co-led a course at the uh, Lifelong Learning Institute at American University on the United Nations, and we coordinated a program on the UN and climate change in October that was sponsored by a number of UU churches. Um, so um, I am thrilled that he is with us today. Um, today's program is certainly very timely on the UN's role in Ukraine. The first uh, line of the preamble in the UN Charter states its primary purpose to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And for 76 years, we have averted a third world war. The first principle of the UN Charter is clear. All members shall refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. So Don uh, has served as ambassador to the UN affiliated International Civil Aviation Organization from 2008 to, to sorry, from yeah, 2008, 2009. Um, I'm sorry, 2006 to 2009. And he was president of the UN Association of the National Capital Area from 2013 to 2017. He still serves on the UNA NCA board and its peace and security committee where he works on UN reform. A graduate of Harvard Law School, Don served for 13 years in the federal government and practiced law at O'Melveny and Myers in DC for 30 years. He is past board chair of Cedar Lane Church and is currently working on a book titled Mark Twain's 10 Lessons for a Healthy Democracy. So Don and I will have a conversation and then open up for questions. So please put your questions and comments in the chat that we'll refer to when the time comes. So Don, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and I just want to say that start with, you know, in the 24-7 coverage that we've been hearing about with the Russian in invasion of Ukraine, could you start by giving us an overview of the UN's role now in Ukraine? Well, thank you, Kim. Um, and uh, thank you for that introduction and especially for your um, comments uh, in quoting from the UN Charter, which are most timely. You know, in his Warsaw speech, President Biden raised the stakes, suggesting that Russia's invasion of Ukraine represents an existential challenge to the rules-based international order and the institutions designed to maintain peace and security among the world's great powers. And in his address to the Security Council, President Zelensky was even more blunt, quote, are you ready to close the UN? Do you think the time of international law is gone? End quote. The Russian invasion of a sovereign state is a clear violation of the first principle of the UN Charter, as you've stated, and yet the United Nations seems unable to adopt sanctions or combat the aggression as it did in Korea or in the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. The Ukraine crisis has shown both the value and the limitations of the United Nations. What has the United Nations done well? Where has it fallen short? Does Russia's veto power in the UN Security Council prevent effective global action, or are there other tools that could be used more effectively? Understanding the role of the United Nations in the Ukraine crisis requires some appreciation of the multifaceted missions of this complex, sprawling, fragmented, and underfunded bureaucracy. So bear with me. The UN's initiatives in Ukraine fall into five general categories. The Security Council, the General Assembly, the International Court of Justice, the Secretary General, and dozens of specialized and affiliated agencies and programs. Let me address briefly each in turn. 
The 15 member Security Council is the only UN body with the authority to issue binding resolutions on member states. It has the power to establish keep peacekeeping operations, enact international sanctions, and authorize military action, especially to respond to acts of aggression by one state against another. The five permanent members of the council, which as you know, include the US, Russia, and China, have the power to veto substantive but not procedural resolutions. Thus, multiple resolutions condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine dating back to 2014 have been vigorously debated, but vetoed by Russia. When the Security Council is deadlocked due to a vote, due to a veto, nine members of the Security Council may call an emergency session of the General Assembly to consider the matter, which the Security Council did on February 27th of this year. While the Russian veto has prevented action binding on all member states, the debates have been an important form for combating Russian disinformation, publicizing Russian atrocities, and shaping world opinion. Second, the General Assembly consists of 193 UN members and is non-binding, that is advisory only. On March 2nd, in a courageous display of solidarity, 141 states voted to condemn Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine, with only four states voting no and the rest abstaining or absent. The majority of states in every region of the world supported the resolution, although Africa was the least unified. On March 24th, with 140 votes in favor, the General Assembly passed a resolution demanding civilian protection and humanitarian access in Ukraine and criticizing Russia for creating dire humanitarian situations. A third body established by the UN Charter is the International Court of Justice in The Hague, which we affectionately refer to as the World Court. In response to a Ukrainian petition, the World Court voted 13 to two, Russia and China dissenting, in favor of ordering Russia to suspend military operations in Ukraine and to prevent armed units that are directed or supported by Russia from taking further action. Although a signatory, Russia has ignored the World Court's proceeding and preliminary order. And regretfully, enforcement is vested in the Security Council and subject to the Russian veto. Fourth, in the UN Charter, the role of the Secretary General is almost an afterthought. Prior secretaries general with varying priorities have used their quote, good offices, unquote, to greatly expand the scope and potential of the position. Secretary General Guterres has criticized Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a violation of international law and has made the protection of civilians the UN's number one priority. On March 4th, March 1st, he initiated a flash appeal to raise $1.7 billion to deliver humanitarian support to the people in Ukraine and the refugees in neighboring countries, addressing the worst refugee crisis since World War II. On March 28th, he called for a humanitarian ceasefire to allow UN agencies humanitarian access. And he appointed Martin Griffins, a coordinator for humanitarian work worldwide, who has traveled to Moscow and Kyiv to negotiate a ceasefire. On April 3rd, the Secretary General called for an independent investigation and accountability for the civilians executed in Bucha, Ukraine. Some critics have argued the Secretary General has not used the full force of his office to resolve the crisis, citing precedents of some of his predecessors. Finally, and fifth, the myriad programs and specialized and affiliated agencies of the UN and their civil society partners have provided critical humanitarian and technical support to Ukraine and the 11.4 million refugees and displaced persons who are fleeing the conflict. In sum, the United Nations is only as strong as its member states enable it to be, but it has played an important role in humanitarian relief, in mobilizing world opinion, and importantly, in the dissemination of facts in a controversy mired in propaganda and false narratives. For many nations, the UN is a source of credible information upon which policy decisions can be made. However, the UN has the potential to do more.
Uh, yes, Don, I agree with you. The UN does that have the potential to do more. So Don, could you elaborate on the work of UN agencies and special programs in Ukraine? And, and could you also talk about uh, the massive refugee flow from Ukraine into neighboring countries? Sure, Kim, but here we get into the alphabet soup of the UN agencies. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, UNICEF, the World Food Program, the International Organization of Migration, the United Nations Development Program, over 1,000 UN employees and eight humanitarian hubs inside Ukraine are working around the clock to help Ukrainian civilians and refugees in neighboring countries. To date, UN agencies and partners have reached some 2.1 million civilians, mostly in Eastern Ukraine, with food, shelter, water, and hygiene supplies. The World Food Program has reached 1.3 million people and plans to reach 2.5 million this month. The World Health Organization says there have been 91 attacks on Ukraine's health providers. It's reached more than- Do you have sound people. now? No. Oops, uh, could somebody please mute whoever is speaking? Loretta, maybe you could mute them. Thank you. Sorry, Don, go ahead. So the World Health Organization says there have been 91 attacks on Ukraine's health providers and have reached more than half a million people in the most vulnerable areas with emergency health trauma and surgery kits. The UN Refugee Agency has a longstanding presence in the region, including Poland, Hungary, Moldova, Slovakia, and Romania, and is coordinating the refugee response with other UN agencies. In Poland, UN staff are registering refugees and providing them with accommodation and assistance. UNICEF, I know you all know UNICEF and probably get solicitations from them, but UNICEF is setting up, has set up blue dot safe spaces at border points and other key locations in receiving countries, providing mothers and children psychosocial support, legal counseling, recreational kits, and hygiene products. The World Food Program feeds 125 million people a day globally. Ukraine and Russia are major grain exporters. The war and sanctions, according to the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, will push 47 more people into food insecurity, bringing the global total to 325 million worldwide. Regretfully, the issue of nuclear weapons has been brought into the conflict by Putin's putting his nuclear forces on high alert, the attack of Russian troops on Ukraine's nuclear facilities, their degradation of Chernobyl's exclusion zone, and speculation about Russia's 10 to 1 advantage in tactical nuclear weapons. The International Atomic Energy Agency is monitoring Ukraine's four nuclear plants on site when they can get access, as well as at Chernobyl. Any use of nuclear weapons should invoke a strong UN response based on the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and the P5 agreement of non-signatories to that treaty, which include Russia and the US, that quote, a nuclear war must never be fought, end quote. The crisis has highlighted the importance of nuclear disarmament, a longstanding UN priority. In the Budapest agreement, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons for the security guarantees of Russia and the West. If, Russian, if Western nations cave to the threat of Russia's nuclear arsenal, Countries like North Korea and Iran will be emboldened. The United Nations Human Rights Council has established a commission of inquiry to gather information on human rights violations and war crimes. The commission is chaired by Norway with Bosnia and Colombia as members. President Zelensky and US Ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas Greenfield, called for suspending Russia from the council. And as you know, on October 7th, by a vote of 93 to 24, the General Assembly suspended Russia's membership for, quote, gross and systematic violations and abuses of human rights, end quote. UNESCO has condemned the invasion, including the targeting of museums, theaters, and other cultural sites, and called for adherence to the 1954 Hague Convention to prevent damage to cultural heritages. Given the death of 17 journalists, it has also raised the obligations under United Nations Security Council resolution 2222 on the protection of journalists in situations of conflict. Finally, UNESCO has addressed the attacks on children, teachers, and schools. 
UNESCO could also address Russia's concerns about respecting the use of the Russian language in Ukraine. A 36 member governing council of the International Civil Aviation Organization has condemned the Russian invasion, urged the Russian Federation to cease threatening the safety and security of civil aviation and invoked its Safe Skies initiative, rerouting aircraft from over conflict areas and citing the downing of Malaysian Flight 17 in Eastern Ukraine on July, 2014. Affiliated international organizations such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have issued strong statements in support of Ukraine. The World Bank has authorized $925 billion in assistance to support essential services. And the IMF is providing 1.4 billion in emergency financing. Now I know that's a lot of agencies and a lot of alphabet soup in detail, but in the end, the UN's strongest operational support has been providing humanitarian assistance, especially to the refugees who have fled to neighboring countries, and importantly, providing neutral factual information to the public, countering the many false narratives. So thanks, Don. We know that Russia is one of the five permanent members of the Security Council, each of which, of course, has the veto. So in light of the Russian veto, what role can the Security Council play in resolving the conflict? Well, candidly, Kim, the war in Ukraine illustrates the somewhat naive assumption underlying the UN Charter that the great powers, including the US and the Soviet Union, would cooperate in preserving world peace. It's time to consider some other tools and bold new strategies. Starting with the least controversial, the Security Council should have continuous publicized briefings on the humanitarian crisis, the targeting of civilians, the indiscriminate use of weaponry, including cluster bombs, the evidence of war crimes committed by the invading forces. Despite the Russian vetoes and Chinese abstentions, the Security Council debates are invaluable in getting out the truth and mobilizing world opinion. Kenyan UN Ambassador Kimani's statement has gone viral, calling Russia's invasion a death threat to the UN Charter, all too familiar to nations born out of colonialism. The Security Council should provide strong support for and frequent briefings by civil society organizations on the ground, delivering humanitarian aid and gathering evidence on war crimes. The Security Council should continue to encourage diplomatic negotiations and the establishment of a ceasefire and no-fly zone, at least over humanitarian corridors, perhaps offering to provide UN peacekeepers or observers to report on violations. One model might be the UN verification mission in Colombia. What about a combination of, say, Indian, Indonesian, and Turkish UN peacekeepers who would maintain a ceasefire while negotiations proceed? The Security Council should continue to address other hotspot issues, including Afghanistan, Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, Mali, Syria, Sudan, and Somalia. The UN's recent success in negotiating a two-month truce ceasefire in Yemen is a hard-won accomplishment. This work is not easy. Most controversial actions should also more controversial actions should also be considered. The Security Council should invoke the 2005 UN Doctrine of Responsibility to Protect. Responsibility to Protect requires the UN to take collective action to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. But what if Russia vetoes Security Council action? The US should swallow its pride and adopt the French proposal that permanent members of the Security Council should abstain from voting on resolutions involving mass atrocities, or they are a party involved. This would not require a charter amendment. A longer term strategy has been proposed by Brookings to amend Article 27 of the charter to allow a two thirds majority of member countries and two thirds of the world's population to override a veto. Alternatively, where a veto prevents action, the Security Council could invoke the 1950 Uniting for Peace Resolution, which it used in 1957 to establish the first emergency force in the Middle East. It could refer the Ukraine matter to the General Assembly to establish a team to negotiate and enforce a ceasefire, perhaps modeled on the P5 plus, which negotiated the Iran nuclear deal. The General Assembly also might create an investigative team led by several nations to coordinate the accumulation of evidence of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. The Security Council could better utilize Articles 52 and 53 of the Charter by delegating more authority to regional organizations 
such as the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is based in Vienna, and was a party to the Minsk agreements and had a special monitoring mission in Ukraine. Ukraine has proposed expelling Russia from the Security Council on the grounds that its succession to the Soviet Union seat was not valid. The General Assembly may expel a member, but only on the recommendation of the Security Council. Over the long term, the Ukrainian crisis demonstrates the importance of modernizing the Security Council to, to reflect today's demographics. While Europe has two permanent members, Africa and Latin America have none. In the early days of the UN, the US, the US even proposed establishing a UN military force. The charter establishes a military staff committee, now mostly dormant, which could be a forum for consultation on issues like Russia's perceived NATO threat. In President Zelensky's address to the US Congress, he proposed the establishment of a union of responsible countries to provide the strength and resources to keep the peace and security and provide humanitarian support. This was a not so veiled criticism that neither the UN nor NATO is up to the job. In his negotiating proposal, Zelensky has stated that if Ukraine agrees to neutrality, it must have outside powers guarantee its peace and security. How could the Security Council support this and what form might it take? US policy has quite frankly been an obstacle to some of the changes that conceivably could make a difference in a future crisis. Reform could start with a more flexible US policy. So um, I have really admired uh, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, but I realize of course his role is, is limited as, as you've said before. So could you elaborate on the role of the Secretary General? Well, you know, Kim, although the Secretary General uh, has uh, condemned the Russian invasion, he has been criticized for not acting more aggressively to negotiate a peaceful resolution, or at least a ceasefire. Um, sometimes people cite a predecessor, Yu Tan, who played a key role in resolving the Cuban Missile Crisis behind the scenes. The UN has a strong cadre of mediators, but the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, which is uh, in charge of that department, Rosemary De Carlo, is an American and Russia already views Guterres as too pro-Western to mediate. The Secretary General, whose background is humanitarian assistance, and is, is considered to be somewhat cautious, but he probably could step up his game working behind the scenes to secure a truce and ceasefire and mobilizing support for the UN's condemnation of the Russian invasion among the 17 African nations, which abstained from the General Assembly's resolutions. He could invoke the UN's record in eradicating colonialism, which is something the Africans should really appreciate. The Secretary General is uniquely positioned to engage China, which is seeking more power in the UN, but is trying to have it both ways. You know, uh, China is uh, Ukraine's largest trading partner, more than double that of any other nation. And the territorial integrity of Ukraine is being assaulted, which defiles not only the UN Charter, but also a very important principle of Chinese diplomacy. So um, what can you tell us about the uh, account about accountability through the international legal system? Well, as I mentioned previously, at the request of Ukraine, the World Court has issued a preliminary order rejecting the Russian claim of genocide and directing Russia to cease military operations in Ukraine. But enforcement of that order by the Security Council is precluded by the Russian veto. There are other legal avenues which remain open. Uh, the International Criminal Court technically is not part of the UN, but it has jurisdiction over genocide, wars of aggression, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And at the request of 39 states, the ICC has appointed its prosecutors, Karen Khan, to fast track an investigation of possible war crimes by individuals involved in the Russian invasion. Targeting of civilians, hospitals, children, and shelters uh, are considered war crimes. Although Russia, Ukraine, and the US are not among the 120 signatories of the International Criminal Court, Ukraine has consented to the ICC's jurisdiction since 2015. And therefore, the indictment of individuals who have committed war crimes is possible. Other parties 
including Ukraine's Prosecutor General and the European Union's Court of Human Rights, have also initiated investigations under domestic statutes. These organizations are accumulating evidence that should be shared to develop a case against specific individuals. Ideally, a better approach would be for the UN to establish a hybrid special court as it did in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, which would be, voted, which would be devoted full time to making the case against the Russian perpetrators of war crimes. Russia's invasion and tactics are a violation of the UN Charter, the Geneva Convention, the Treaty Against Genocide, and depending on future developments, other treaties such as chemical and biological weapons conventions and possibly treaties banning landmines, cluster bombs, and the use of prohibited nuclear weapons. So there's a, a, a strong basis in international law to, uh, to continue the accumulation of evidence uh, against the perpetrators of these war crimes. Mm -hmm. So overall, Don, how would you rate the UN's response to this invasion? Well, keeping in mind that the United Nations is only as effective as its member states enable it to be, I would say the UN's strong points have been its humanitarian relief efforts, the on-site work of the Atomic Energy Agency, the courageous actions by the General Assembly and the World Court. The UN has been, as, <clears throat> has been an important source of reliable information. And despite the veto, the Security Council has shined a light on Russia's violation of international law and its atrocities, helping to mobilize world opinion and state action. Keep in mind, the UN is addressing enormous global challenges that compete for its time and very limited financial resources. There is resentment in some places that Ukraine has such a high profile or the situations in Syria, Sudan, the Congo, Somalia, Miramar, and others fester. <clears throat> now we can all applaud the unity of NATO, the European Union, the US and other democratic nations in supporting Ukraine's resistance to Russian aggression. However, in fairness, these alignments can be perceived as confrontational. Certainly Putin and Xi find them provocative. Only at the UN does every state have a seat at the table, even if the distribution of power is out of alignment and ripe for reform. And even though none of its members, including the United States, fully embraces its goals. The principles underlying the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the many international treaties defining international law, and the sustainable development goals represent the highest aspirations of the global community. If Russia succeeds in recolonizing Ukraine, these aspirational principles will be greatly diminished. Despite its limitations, the United Nations is essential and US leadership and financial support for its many missions are critical in working toward a more effective and efficient United Nations. Thanks much for the opportunity to um, engage in this dialogue with you, Kim. Well, thank you, Don. And I certainly agree that the UN is such an important uh, entity. And, and also we need to focus on more efficiency and effectiveness. So now we're turning over to questions. Uh, there are a few in the chat. If you have any other questions, feel free to write them in the chat. <clears throat> I also have a, additional questions on my own if there's time. So the first question, Don, is were Ukraine and other former Soviet bloc countries specially fast-tracked into the UN after their independence? And have they been active in serving and supporting most of the agencies? Yeah, I think that, you could, of course, Ukraine has had a, uh, an interesting history of being pro-Soviet, part of the Soviet Union, and then uh, breaking away, and then having uh, leadership which is pro-Russian, and then having that leadership uh, evacuate. So it's had a, uh, a troubled history, but certainly since the, uh, the last few years, it's, been, it's uh, operated as an independent nation and been a strong supporter of the United Nations. And it's interesting that at the time of the UN, it was the Soviet Union that insisted that Ukraine had a separate seat at the UN. So um, I guess one could make the argument that, that Ukraine has as much right to secede to the Russian permanent position on the Security Council as, the, as Russia does, since they, they both were, uh, were charter members of the UN. 
So the other question doesn't really relate to Ukraine. Uh, so I'll see if you'd like to speak to this. It's, explain how the US invasion of Iraq the second time is different or justified in Afghanistan. So I'm not sure entirely the question, but feel free to respond. I think that's an important question because, I mean, it's, it's certainly one of the reasons why the US has not been a signatory to a lot of international treaties, including the Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court, because um, we went with the largest military in the world, I guess we're larger than the next seven nations combined, and with our troops all over the world, and with situations like you had in Iraq with the uh, torture in the prison and so forth, the US would be susceptible to uh, the uh, in, uh, to investigations for war crimes and so forth. And I don't think the US was ready to, to see George Bush or Colin Powell or Rumsfeld uh, subject to war crimes investigations. Um, Iraq was a, a little bit, well, there were two Iraq. I mean, certainly the invasion uh, uh, of Iraq, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, that was uh, a, a subject to the UN Security Council resolutions uh, supporting uh, the US uh, putting together a coalition uh, to prevent that invasion. And then of course, uh, the US decided not to go further than simply to, to uh, terminate the invasion. It did not proceed into Baghdad or, or try to uh, a regime change in Iraq. So that was perfect. That was done in, in accordance with the, the UN uh, charter. And, uh, but the second uh, invasion of Iraq, uh, the Bush administration did not wait for the UN to, to act. Um, the UN would have preferred to spend more time lurking, looking for those mysterious weapons of mass destruction and uh, acted uh, unilaterally with a much smaller coalition. And so I, I, it would be uh, uh, subject to the criticism that it, would, it violated the UN Charter. It was the invasion of another state and, and a regime change. Um, whether or not the, the, per, the purpose of doing it was not to occupy that territory uh, and was not to uh, provide a threat to the civilian population of that territory. It was to uh, remove the threat of the alleged weapons of mass destruction and the, uh, uh, the, the war crimes that were being committed by, the, uh, by Saddam Hussein. So I suppose you could say the US motives were, were better than the Russian motives uh, in moving in, uh, into a, another sovereign state. And the US never intended to stay there indefinitely. Um, whereas, uh, and, and of course, Putin claims that he has no intention to stay there indefinitely. He'd just like to set up a different government and uh, one that would be friendly to Russia. Uh, so clearly uh, the US, uh, there are limitations on the US credibility, which in my mind means that all the more important for the UN to be uh, a strong uh, voice in, uh, on this issue because some people, uh, some nations will be very skeptical of the US voice given our record. In fact, you can go back to the early days of our, uh, uh, of our uh, country and, and find many violations of human rights. So um, the UN can speak with much more credibility, I think, on these issues than the US can. So Don, speaking of war crimes, we've heard a lot about war crimes this past week, actually, as well as genocide. What would be the best way to address this? I mean, one is through the International Criminal Court, the ICC, but sadly, the US is not a member of it. How, how should this best be addressed? Well, there are a lot of different uh, possible uh, fora. Uh, the ICC has already initiated an investigation on a fast track basis. Um, the uh, ICC, because of uh, Ukraine, although it's not a signatory, and neither is Russia or the US, um, has a, a, a consented to the jurisdiction of the ICC. And therefore, the ICC has jurisdiction to investigate and indict individuals, but not states, for uh, war crimes, genocide, or crimes against humanity, it can, the, the most obvious violation of international law, which you stated in your introduction, is, is the uh, aggressive action by one state against another sovereign state. But uh, the ICC could not undertake that because Russia is not a member, the state is not a member of the ICC. Um, and, uh, the ICC takes a long time. I think they've had about 40 indictments and they've all been Africans, uh, which has caused some criticism from the, the African continent. Um, and in, 
if you look at history, um, there have been very few occasions where uh, a person in power has been successfully prosecuted. I mean, the Nuremberg trials came after the unconditional surrender of Germany, the Tokyo Tribunal uh, after the unconditional surrender of Japan. And even Rwanda, for example, it was the, the successful government that was able to turn over the, uh, the individuals who could uh, prosecuted the war crimes to the uh, Rwanda Tribunal. So uh, it's very difficult to, to be successful in, um, in, in, in indicting and getting jurisdiction over someone who remains in power. Um, Milosevic was out of power at the time uh, of his conviction. So uh, the ICC has its limitations. It takes a long time. The, the, the EU uh, Human Rights Court, the, uh, uh, the Commission, UN um, uh, Council on Human Rights has initiated an investigation. That's an important forum. Uh, one of the most important forums is Ukraine. Uh, the, the Prosecutor General of Ukraine has uh, 50,000 people working to, to collect evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And under the Ukraine statute, uh, they could well uh, uh, and indict individuals and bring them to trial if they can get jurisdiction over them. Uh, the main problem is getting jurisdiction over them, but even being indicted uh, would limit one's capacity to travel. If the ICC were to in indict a Russian generals, um, then, uh, or uh, uh, Putin, uh, it, it, he, anytime he traveled to a state that was willing to accept the warrant of his arrest, uh, he would be in, in danger. So. Um, it does pose some limitations on them. Uh, but I think uh, the important thing is to coordinate the development of, the, of all the evidence and information. That, that given the, the um, cell phones, the prevalent, prevent, this is the first, as I think as Friedman said, this is the first uh, wired war we've ever had where there's so much uh, uh, evidence being collected on, uh, on an hourly basis through cell phones and so forth. The collection of all this evidence and getting the names and frankly, getting the names out. Who are these generals? Who are these commanders who are uh, allowing, if not directing these atrocities to take place in Bucha and other places would be an important, um, an important step in and of itself. Um, the ideal situation in my view would be to have a special tribunal created like was in former Yugoslavia or Rwanda. In those cases, it was done by the Security Council. So the question is, could, could the General Assembly uh, be authorized to do something like that because the Security Council is unable to act. Um, but clearly, uh, I think a number of organizations are taking important steps and it's important that the UN um, help to facilitate the uh, sharing of information and evidence uh, so that when the time comes, uh, a prosecution can be, can be made. So we have some more questions from the audience, Don. Uh, this one actually has three questions in it. Uh, what can corporations do to amplify pressure on Putin? Secondarily, how can reparations be made to Ukraine by Russia in the way of reprisals against him? And how can such be made enduring? So let's see, how can be made enduring such that Russia is a neutralized militarily? Well, I, I, you know, um... I guess it's the, the uh, uh, dean of, of the Graduate School of, of Management at Yale has is, is, uh, been very active in uh, preparing a list of U.S. companies that have withdrawn from Russia. There's still quite a few of them that are, that are still working there, but some of the major ones have withdrawn um, and at a substantial cost, um, including McDonald's, of course. Um, and then there are others that are continuing to work there. So making a, a making this information public and more visible, I think is helpful. Um, in terms of reparations, um, there's, it's been suggested that some of the assets in the United States, on 350 billion or something assets in the United States or Europe that are subject to um, sanctions could be um, confiscated and used to help support uh, rebuilding or humanitarian relief in Ukraine, although that presents a lot of legal issues that would have to be sorted through. And it's, it's not clear <laughs> that that could be accomplished without substantial litigation. Um, and what, um, what was the third question? Well, <clears throat> I'm trying to summarize it here. Uh, how can such be made that, sorry, 
how can uh, be made such that Russia is a neutralized militarily? Well, uh, you know, the sanctions by preventing certain uh, trade with Russia on certain technical uh, components is going to hurt their military. Um, I mean, the big issue right now is that unless there are sanctions against the uh, oil and gas exports of Russia, we really, uh, even Europe is helping to finance Russia's military. But if, if you could embargo uh, Russian and gas uh, exports uh, to most of the world, that would uh, diminish Russia's capacity to finance its military and its military operations. Uh, one of the lessons, I guess, of, of the, the in, Russian aggression is that the military is not as good as our uh, government thought it would be, uh, that it, it was not particularly well planned. Maybe it was just planned uh, on the idea that 48 hours Ukraine would welcome Russians with open with roses and laurels or whatever, open arms. And so they didn't really plan for the logistical requirements of a long and of a long term uh, battle. But um, the Russian military did not perform very well. Its uh, command is uh, too uh, hi hierarchical, so the local commanders have little authority. There are no, no non commissioned officers and so forth. So uh, the, the military was not as strong as people assumed it would be. Uh, but this may change now as they're uh, regrouping and focusing on Eastern Ukraine, and uh, which has always been their primary target anyway. Um, and we may see. Uh, a prolonged and, and more efficient uh, military force uh, in the future, unfortunately, in a prolonged war. But um, clearly, uh, by, by not providing certain, by Europe and the United States not providing certain types of exports, we can diminish their technical capacity to upgrade the military. And if we put an embargo on oil and gas, it would diminish their financial capacity to, to finance their military. And one wonders whether um, Voice of America and other means of getting information to the Russians, which is so difficult because uh, Russia has eliminated all free press. And, uh, and I, they've even thrown out now Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. So there's very little internally, uh, but if, if we can get the word out, even to the Russian soldiers who, Seem, some of them seem very confused by what's going on here, which is understandable. Uh, if Ukraine is a, a part of Russia and they're all brothers and sisters, uh, this is not a way to treat your family. Um, so um, if this word can get more to the, to the Russian people and to the Russian troops, uh, there's already been some examples of Russian uh, soldiers refusing to uh, uh, engage and unfortunately there are other examples of Russian and they're not just Russian soldiers there's Chetnians and Syrians there may be some Syrians there now uh, which uh, uh, have a long history of, uh, of engaging in uh, war crimes in other situations uh, that also have, have uh, um, you know violated international law so um, I think we, you know, we should do everything possible to diminish the capacity of the Russian military. But the main thing is to give the weapons. I'm, I hate to say this as a former Peace Corps volunteer who's not one who loves war, but providing the, the weapons that the Ukrainians need to defend themselves uh, at least increases their capacity of coming out with some kind of a, a resolution because everybody that knows Putin says the only thing he ever responds to is force. He doesn't, I mean, he has no sense of empathy for um, what the rest of us are all seeing. In fact, he's not letting his own country see any of this to the best of his ability. So if the only thing he responds to is force, then providing the weapons uh, to the Ukrainians who seem to have the, uh, the spirit, the will, and the capacity um, seems to be what is needed at the moment if we're going to force an agreement, a settlement, uh, which... Uh, does not reward Putin for his aggression. That's, that's the problem. I mean, why should Putin get anything uh, out, of a, uh, uh, out of the uh, aggression and the, the prosecution of uh, crimes against humanity? And on the other hand, uh, as we all know, the 
huge obstacle to uh, responding to Russian aggression is the fact that Russia has more nuclear weapons than any other state in the world and also has a huge advantage in tactical nuclear weapons, which has been uh, speculated that he might try to use tactical low, uh, low grade nuclear weapons in a more targeted way. But given, <laughs> given the way the Russians have uh, acted in Ukraine with respect to the nuclear facilities there, one wonders about their capacity to use good judgment in the use of anything nuclear. Uh, in today's post, there was a good article saying that the Russian military was not well trained, uh, didn't have logistics thought through, didn't have supplies, didn't have backstopping, and most importantly, didn't really have a strong plan. So one might refer to that for more information. Another question, Don, is what role did the U.S. play in provoking the invasion? And I let me add a question on top of that is, did Trump's support of Putin play any role here? Well, you know, in a way, it's, it's a shame, given the way things have developed, that the Russians didn't take the U.S. up on uh, the offer to negotiate issues relating to NATO's operations in Eastern Europe. Uh, and the U.S. did put some very serious issues on the table. I'm not sure I know what they all are. In fact, I'm not sure anybody knows what they all were or what the U.S. was going to talk about. But um, if you try to look at it from Putin's perspective, um, at one point, you know, he came up in the KGB uh, in East Germany and then um, under the Soviet Union. And he thinks the greatest tragedy of history was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and to see uh, countries like Poland and the Baltic states uh, part of NATO, and then to see uh, uh, weapons in the Eastern uh, Europe, um, and then uh, to see uh, the sort of Star Wars initiative during the Reagan administration, which was, we, we, we said it was to pre prevent uh, nuclear missiles from a place like Europe, Iran, but the Russians said, well, why are you putting them in places like Eastern Europe? Um, and so you could see where, uh, give, given his history, uh, and he feels threatened by the NATO expansion into Eastern Europe. I regretfully for him, uh, what he's done is only made it NATO more unified, has made uh, more uh, NATO troops in Eastern Europe and uh, increased the prospect of Finland and Sweden and possibly other states joining NATO. Um, you know, from my naive perspective back in the 1990s in the Clinton administration, there was much more consultation with, with uh, Russia about uh, participation in joint exercises and consultation and transparency with NATO. And, uh, you know, in, in a normal Russian leadership, that would be something to really work for, uh, to, to try to, to diffuse the threat that NATO uh, may appear to oppose to, to Russia, is to more transparency, more consultation. But Russia's closed its office in, in Brussels uh, and is, is moving in the opposite direction. And, and so it'll take a long time and probably not while Putin remains in power to uh, reopen a dialogue on those issues because that's really the crux of the matter. And yet in the end, I suppose the conclusion is that that really wasn't so much what was bothering Putin as his somewhat longstanding view that Ukraine is really part of Mother Russia, Russian Mir, that uh, you know Catherine the Great uh, started and created Odessa and uh, that Kiev is, was the source of the, the Rush, the people, and, and therefore it all should be one, one uh, culture, one uh, uh, ethnicity, which has been taken over by this Western dominated uh, uh, Zelensky government. Um, uh, and so maybe, you know, Putin, I think Putin's misreading of history and misreading of, of culture is, is, it, is probably more uh, at fault here than any provocation by, by NATO itself. So Don, here's a comment to, from your last uh, comment that you may wanna just say something briefly before moving to the next question. Somebody asks, doesn't the flood of arms to Ukraine make its government less likely to negotiate and compromise thus prolonging the war? Uh, the only problem is that if Putin only responds to force, 
it, you know, we could stop all the arms shipments and, and that would probably cripple the Ukrainian military, which has been trained by the US and by NATO. Um, but th then uh, if you're gonna have a settlement of some kind, it's going to be on Putin's terms, isn't it? And that means the loss of territory, if not uh, a toppling of, of the Zelensky government. And the question is, should that be rewarded? I mean, in, in, a, in a fair and just world, in a world governed by the UN Charter, um, should we reward a nation that invades a sovereign state with uh, territory or with more rights and privileges in that state than it had before its aggression? And apparently the only way to counter Putin is uh, through force. Uh, if someone has a better idea, I'd, I'd love to hear it. I mean, I'd love to see, as I mentioned in my talk, I'd love to see the Secretary General persuade Xi that the two of them. Now, there's an article in the Post today also by um, uh, Graham Allison, I think, um, that, that Biden and, and Xi could mediate a result here. I'm not sure that maybe the Secretary General and Xi could mediate a result here. Uh, but if it means ceding territory, that, that, that's a victory for Russia. And you don't want to reward this type of aggression. Yeah, no, I saw, I saw that article. I, I thought it was excellent. So I'm going to read one more uh, question, and then Carl has his hand raised for a live question. We have various more questions, John, and we only have about eight more minutes. Um, has the U.S. given more attention to NATO than the U.N.? After the breakup of the USSR, NATO has expanded its membership to include former Eastern Bloc nations. Has this triggered the present aggression of Russia? Well, certainly Russia would say so, Putin would say so. Uh, although, as I said earlier, I think his view about Ukraine being part of Mother Russia is probably even more of a motive for him. But um, yeah, I mean, I think he, uh, I, I had an opportunity to visit the Baltic states a few years ago. And, you know, one can see uh, the amazing people, that, you know, only a couple of million people uh, living in those states. And with a lot of Russians living there too, that Stalin had brought in to run the factories and so forth. But they have their own culture. They have their own freedom. They're some of the most advanced economies in the world, Estonia. Um, and and uh, they suffered under the Nazis. They suffered under the Soviets. All their intelligentsia was sent to Siberia. They retained their culture under the domination of Russia only by uh, music. They, they would meet secretly and sing. And, and that was the way they kept their culture going during the Soviet domination. So the history there just, they finally found freedom. They exercised their freedom with enormous uh, 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 responsibility and economic strength. And they, and by joining NATO, it means that under Article 5 of NATO, if Russia moves across the border and attacks Estonia, we have NATO comes to their rescue. So. Um, but just given the, uh, the culture and the people and the fact that they were suppressed first by the Nazis and then by the Soviets and have lived through all of that, with it, 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 it's, it's a kind of um, uh, patriotism that we don't see in this country very much anymore. Maybe we did during World War II, I don't know. Um, but it, it, uh, and sure, Russia may perceive it as a threat, but the way they treated those Baltic states during the uh, Soviet era um, certainly justifies their uh, being part of the Western, both NATO and the EU. So we have a number of questions, both live and written. If we could have sort of brief questions and brief answers, Don, we can try and get through them all. Carl, you're first, please unmute. Yes, Don, uh, I wanted to get your perspective with your longtime involvement with the UN that you know, I think right now we're at the cusp of maybe a realignment of geopolitical alliances. Certainly we saw China and Russia now, their long-term agreement, and you can see how that's going to affect uh, minerals and other raw materials. But, you know, in the 70s, there was the non-alignment movement. And when you see recently some of these votes where you had 50 people abstaining, I mean, in a de facto sense, that can only say they're politically at least aligned with either Russia or China, you know, through the Belt and Road Initiative in Africa. And I mean, you know, the UN came out of the model of the Western democracy mindset, but is it necessarily always going to be bad that 
the alignment between Russia and China might bring in other countries and isn't the forum of the United Nations itself built to, to go with the majority of the flow. And even though we're not in America, maybe fully supportive of it, but it could in itself, if it's a healthy organization, it could help meet those future challenges. Well, clearly, for example, India and Brazil voted against the most recent uh, action by the General Assembly, um, which is not encouraging. And, and uh, China uh, has abstained in the Security Council, which is encouraging, rather than voting with the Russians to veto. Um, but um, I, I think it would be a mistake if the world were divided into you know, two, like we did during much of the Cold War, into two uh, uh, hemispheres, uh, uh, hegemony. hegemony. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's true that the UN can be perceived as, as being uh, more Western, coming out of Western ideals, but I think there's also a lot in, 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 in Chinese philosophy that supports the Declaration on Human Rights as well, it, it, even if it's not administered well in today's China. Um, so, um, you know, I think the UN can, can do, we could reform the Security Council in a better, you know, uh, there's been talk about this for 25 years, but nobody's willing to really take action. Maybe this will be the, the action forcing event that if the Security Council reflected uh, participation by Africa, more participation by Latin America, neither of which has a permanent representative on the council. Asia only has one and it happens to be China. Uh, but what about Japan or what about India? Um, so uh, if, if we had a, a security council that was more reflective of today's demographics, that would help, I think, bring people together rather than separate them apart. And I think it would be a tragedy and in some respects, Hopefully, this Russian invasion will put some distance between China and Russia, uh, because it's it violates every principle of Chinese foreign policy. Uh, the, the sovereign, I mean, they're all Chinese are always complaining that we are criticizing their internal policies, and we have no business criticizing them. And yet, Russia is invading the sovereignty of a, of a neighbor nation, which is just which is totally inconsistent with Chinese. Policy. So I think we play that correctly and show a little boldness. The U.S. would have to uh, give up some of its uh, uh, power within the U.N. system, I suppose, that we can work toward keeping a global community together rather than breaking into separate parts with proxy wars breaking out in different places as they did during the Cold War. Thank you. Don Cherry, please unmute. Don, are you there? Okay, it's Hamid's question here. Come in. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much for enlightening us. Sir, uh, the purpose of Russia invading Ukraine is stated as follows, that out of the eight invasions of Russia that have happened the last thousand years, six of them have passed through Ukraine. So Russia wants to stop the land routes for the invading forces to come to Russia. This particular idea is not different than that the large power do not want their neighbors to be an ally of their enemies. Uh, take an example of the Cuba towards the United States, Nicaragua towards the United States, on and on. Uh, so some kind, this particular complaint, to an extent it's valid, it need to be addressed by any mediating forces, which in this case does not happen in one, but you have to start, why did Russia, other than the tunes of glory, and uh, invaded Ukraine anyway? I think you just pointed out, I think a lot of people on this uh, uh, Zoom have as much ability, you read this, you, you see the same media, you have the same sense of history, so uh, I will defer to you on those questions. I think a lot of you, uh, I don't have any answers to that. I, th I think that uh, uh, the U.S. That, that's it. Just stresses the importance of the United Nations, and we we'd have to give up some of our power, but we we already have a, so much influence in the United Nations anyway, uh, in in various bodies. And uh, let's look to the to um, 
a neutral source of uh, resolving some of these issues as opposed to uh, putting ourselves on the line with our military and with our history that we have to explain to a lot of countries. Well, thank you, Don. Uh, we only really have time now for one more question. So I'm gonna summarize several here. Um, how can you and uh, agencies such as UNICEF be more vocal and active about such atrocities as starvation, rape, sex trafficking, and other crimes against humanity? And secondarily, if the Congress changes to a GOP majority, what might be the impact? Uh, well, I, I don't know that you really want UNICEF. I mean, UNICEF does a wonderful, job is probably the most efficient uh, and well-known part of the UN system. Um, uh, and, but clearly the, the uh, Human Rights uh, Council and the Security Council can continue to raise. And I think it's been one of the real values. Everybody keeps talking about the Russian veto in the Security Council, but the fact is, you know, you probably have heard a lot more about the Security Council in the last two weeks than you have in the last two years. Um, and it, it, you've heard about it because it's it's shined a light on what's happening here, not only in the invasion itself, but on the atrocities that have been committed in that invasion. So I think those are the uh, fora in which, it, and clearly the General Assembly has to continue to be active. The uh, legal system has to continue to be active um, and so forth. Uh, so in terms of what the, uh, if the Republicans contain control, uh, uh, retain control of Congress, the Republicans seems to be, uh, for the most part, uh, um, very supportive of uh, US support for the Ukrainians and opposition to the Russian aggression. If anything, they've said the current administration has been too late to offer weapons uh, and uh, they would uh, urge more weapons to be made available. In fact, Congress has got bills now that would uh, eliminate or suspend Russia from uh, most favored nation and so forth. So I, I, I don't see this, uh, if anything, um, if the Republicans gain control in Congress, we may be forced into uh, more uh, a combat with Russia, which could, <laughs> in the worst case scenario, was up in World War III and nuclear war. So uh, I don't see them as trying to back off. Well, Don, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much. This has been so informative. We appreciate you sharing your wealth of wisdom and experience talking about the UN, such a timely and important topic. I wanna to thank everyone for attending today for your questions and interest in the topic. And uh, again, stay tuned for our next Contemporary Issues Forum on Sunday, May 1st. So thank you all for attending and thanks again, Don.